From the Grand Ballroom at Executive Caterers at Landerhaven, thank you for joining us as we celebrate more than 20 years of presenting important and timely discussions. Corporate Club is the direct link for community leaders to connect with regional businesses, government, and nonprofit organizations. This series of programs deals with those issues and persons that impact on the lives of those who live in Northeastern Ohio. Corporate Club at Landerhaven begins right now. Welcome, everyone, to the Executive Caters at Landerhaven. My name is Wayne Dawson. We are here this afternoon for uh, what we call Driving Innovations. And we are so very, very honored to uh, be with the big players when it comes to auto dealerships here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, among them, we are talking almost 60 dealerships. So once again, we're very, very happy to have these gentlemen here as we talk about the latest news in the auto industry, which means a, a great deal to us here in Northeast Ohio. I am very proud to announce uh, or to introduce Tom Ganley from the Ganley Auto Group. Mr. Ganley, thank you very much for spending some time with us this afternoon. You're quite welcome. Also, Jim Brown from the Classic Auto Group. Mr. Brown, thank you as well. And last but not least, Bernie Marino from the uh, Collection Auto Group. Thank you, gentlemen, for, for sharing some time with us this afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'm going to start out, and each one of you can answer this question. I just want to know, first of all, when did you get started in the auto business, and um, how did you move up to where you are right now? You can start, John. Well, that's a great question, uh, Wayne. Um, I started as a very young man working in the automobile industry. Actually, I was in high school. And it grew from there, and I worked at uh, Frank Nero Lincoln Mercury as a very young man. I was his sales manager at 21, general manager at 24, and at 24 I opened my first dealership, April 1st, 1968. How did you get the capital to open your first dealership? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, capital was very short. Uh, the manufacturer loaned me some money. Uh, they co-signed a note at a finance company, and I had a small sum of money. And the rest is history. And the rest is history. <laughs> yes, it is. Wait. Mr. Brown, what about you? <clears throat> well, I started at 25 when I graduated from Kent State, selling cars, and I sold cars in Louisiana for six years, two years then in Florida, Orlando, Florida, and then five years in California, San Diego, and I saved up. $400,000 in those years. And uh, General Motors called me one day and said, uh, there's an open point in Mineral, Ohio, and we'll back you with Motors Holding Division if you want to go into business. And I said, uh, yes. And that was my first store, 1979. 1979. Mr. Marino, yours is an amazing story. Could you share it with us? Yeah, I, I always knew I wanted to be in the car business since I was a little kid. My uh, lifelong ambition from when I was 12 years old was to be the chairman of the board of General Motors before it became a government position. That's a government <laughs> position today. I'm glad to remember that. <laughs> but, uh, so I went to the University of Michigan, uh, worked at Automobile Magazine, uh, went to work for Saturn Corporate, decided the corporate world wasn't for me, went to work for a car dealer in Boston for 12 years, and then uh, nine years ago, about right now actually, Mercedes asked me to buy Mercedes-Benz in North Olmsted. Uh, so like, like Tom, uh, uh, not, not a lot of capital. I cleared out my 401k, mortgaged everything I had, and bought that one dealership. So you took a chance, basically. Yep. Talk about the uh, dealerships you own right now and uh, just your, your plans for growth. Yeah, we, have, uh, thir we represent 31 brands in uh, four, four cities, uh, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Boston, and Coral Gables, Florida. Uh, we um, have 19 facilities, about 800 team members. And, uh, you know, we, we're not looking to grow just for the sake of growth. We, we look for strategic opportunities is really what we're looking at. Mr. Brown, of course, you have your, your uh, campuses, uh, mainly on the, the east side of the city of Cleveland suburbs. Talk about those. Well, <clears throat> I think I've only bought two stores. Uh, I got all the rest of them from the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very difficult thing to do today to get uh, franchises in good locations for free. Mm -hmm. But uh, almost all of mine were for free. And so uh, I was really uh, at the right place at the right time. And, uh, and so that's uh, how we grew the business. Talk about the, the, uh, the campus concept. How has that been good for you? 
Well, the, car, the, the dealerships are all there together, but back in 1982 or 83, uh, a man came to me and had uh, 30 acres for sale in what is now downtown Minner, mm -hmm. and uh, it was zoned in industrial, and they didn't see any industrial buildings come in, wouldn't know if I'd buy it, and I, so I paid uh, $45,000 an acre for all that land. Mm -hmm. and I was lucky there also, mm -hmm. because then I later got that land rezoned, commercial, and then started building dealerships on it. So it was uh, something that really is not repeatable. It's uh, kind of a once-in-a-lifetime deal. That's how it happened. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mr. Ganley, uh, talk about your dealerships. Well, I'm pleased to talk about them. I'm very proud of them. Uh, automotive News ranks us the 32nd largest automotive group in the United States, the largest in the state of Ohio, employs somewhere around 2,000 people, and that, I might mention 2,000 great people. We've been very selective and uh, been able to surround ourselves with some really magnificent people. And in my opinion, that's what business is all about. You're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. And I have folks here right now at a couple tables, and uh, I, I'm not ashamed to tell them I am very proud of them. Uh, it's been an interesting trip through life for me. Uh, I was not as fortunate to, uh, to get the dealerships for free as Jim Brown was. I've had to pay for all of mine. <laughs> And certainly that's been a challenge, uh, but I've had um, uh, good professional advice and I must tell you that the automobile industry is the greatest industry in the history of our country and the greatest industry in the history of the world. With that in mind, you know, yes, Mr. Brown? Tom, seriously, you ought to run for Senate. <laughs> <laughs> been there, done that. <laughs> You just mentioned about the greatness of the auto industry, and right now it is experiencing boom times. Uh, what do you attribute this to? Wayne, another good question, and thank you for that. Um, there, there's something that happens in our industry called pent-up demand. And we've all just come through what's referred to as the greatest recession of all time. Most folks didn't buy cars during that great recession. So we're now coming out of it, which is another separate story. Cleveland, Northern Ohio is usually the first in a recession, the last out. This time we've been very fortunate. We were the first in, but we've been the first out also. And, and automobile sales have been very good. And just recently, the most recent numbers from Automotive News are we're traveling at an annual rate nationally of 16.8 million cars. Uh, that's a huge number, and once again, it's because it's a great industry. And uh, my company, the Ganley Auto Group, uh, will, we, last year we finished with 45,000 cars. This year we're hoping to touch 50,000 cars. Mr. Burrito, do, do dealer incentives play a role in, in what's happening in the, in the auto industry today? Yeah, absolutely. What it does is uh, you know, we love the idea that the car companies want to kill each other on a daily basis. Uh, that makes us all, that makes the three of us very happy. Uh, they, they want to uh, keep their factories going and keep production going. So when they see a slowdown, they put incentives out there, which makes it easier for us to sell cars because the cars become less expensive. Mr. Brown, good times right now, but we all know everything is cyclical. Uh, uh, what do you think the future holds long term? I wish I knew, uh, but I don't. I have no idea. It's whatever uh, happens to the economy. Uh, the economy has been strong. And, uh, and, and the factories really have been incentivizing this whole thing. What's um, the main thing that drives car sales in your mind? Well, when the factories want to sell cars, uh, typically that's it. In other words, uh, <clears throat> you can go into a car dealership today, um, and for instance, just take any car, a Hyundai, and uh, you can drive out of there in a $25,000 Hyundai for $200 a month mm -hmm. with nothing down. Mm -hmm for 36 months. That's almost free. That's almost a free car. And is that it, beneficial to you, the dealer, when, when you have uh, d deals like that? Does that sound like a sales pitch or something? <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine, 180 a month. It's <laughs> 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 our final offer, right? <laughs> I mean, does it reach a point where, where it's uh, too good for the customer? Yeah, the, the price is too good? Of yes. Of I don't think so. Yeah. No, they're terrific. And that's why, in, the, in our case, that's why sales are up 12% this month over mm -hmm. the prior month because of the deals the manufacturers are giving. Talk about the importance of interest rates. They've been low so long. I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know. I mean, compared to history, 
if interest rates went up four or five percent, even to six or seven percent, it would it would be tough because uh, car dealers are handling huge inventories now. Uh, I mean, unheard of high inventories because sales are good, the carrying costs are zero, and so people have lots of cars in stock and a good you know selection for customers. But if it was a big jack in interest rates, it would hurt the entire economy and especially the car business. When, when you talk about the sale of new cars, which is which is great right now, does it affect the sale of used cars? It certainly does. Negatively or positively? No, it, it affects it positively because there's trade-ins coming in. But just to add to what Jim said about interest rates, uh, I've been in this business long enough that in 1980 and 81, interest rates were 21 and a half percent. I don't know if everybody in this room can remember that, but uh, we certainly appreciate interest rates now at two and three and four percent. It makes an entrepreneur and it makes business uh, much more attractive and much easier to conduct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let, let's talk about the, the new versus used cars. I mean, uh, for you guys, is it better to sell a new car or is it better to sell a used car? Mr. Burke? Well, they go hand in hand, really. Uh, it's, it's entirely an uh, economic thing. The economy's good. They're going to buy new and used cars. And the more new cars you sell, the more used cars you take on trade, and that builds your used car business. So they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Mr. Marino, the importance of a, a good used car department for a dealership. Yeah, it's critical because uh, used cars, uh, the more you can sell used vehicles, if you can structure your dealership so it does a very good job selling used cars, mm -hmm. you can put more money in the trade-ins because you're able to retail those cars. And those cars uh, are in a scenario today that they're fully reconditioned, certified vehicles. So we spend a lot of money in the service and parts departments on those cars. So it impacts the whole dealership uh, pretty dramatically. You just touched on something you said, service. Uh, how critical is, is a service department to your operations? Tom? Well, service department is paramount. You buy a car, usually in one day, but you bring it in to the dealership that you bought it from, on average, eight times. During those eight visits, if any one of them is unsatisfactory, you generally won't go back to that dealership to buy a car. So we strive, all of us in the industry, strive very hard at what we refer to as customer satisfaction. Uh, we try to do it 100%, but if you look at the history of the world, nobody's been able to please everyone 100%, but we sure as hell try to make sure that we take, and if you're not happy and you bring a car in for service, please speak to management, let them know, because we presume that you're happy with every visit unless we're told otherwise. So don't be bashful, if you're not pleased, step up and ask to talk to management. Jim, what are you guys doing to make sure your service department remains strong across the board? Well, it's uh, pretty simple. Um, you have to take care of every customer. And in many cases, you give them things they don't even deserve, but you have to take care of every customer. Your, your entire future is, is built on it. And um, we've developed a culture where you don't have to call, you just bring your car in. Most stores, uh, in fact, all the stores, we'll wash your car if you want to wash, we'll give you a loaner if you want a loaner, we'll take you somewhere if you need to go. But we feel that, that uh, service, you can, you can do away with a lot of advertising if when your customer thinks of a new car, they say, there's only one place I can go. And that's Joe's uh, service advisor down at Classic. We've got to buy our next car there. And, that's, and you build that over year after year after year, where I get letters every day, you know, complimenting whatever service department. But that's how your business is built. Brody, same question to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, technology is uh, a very uh, transformative technology for us right now. Much like, by the way, the car was when it was invented. It really transformed society. And the technology is transforming society again in that same massive way. And so as, a, as any company, not just a car dealership, you have to be completely obsessed with your client experience. You know, it's all about time, transparency, making the service visit quick, making it efficient. And you're not just competing with what customers thought other car dealership visits were like. You're really competing with other retail visits, the, whether it's the Apple Store or Neiman Marcus, an experience like that. So you, it's not about just getting the customer satisfied. You really have to create a positive memory for that client and experience. Talk about the new car warranty. They, they seem to be getting better and better, stronger and stronger. Is, is that good for, obviously good for consumer confidence? Cars only last three years. Uh, you should only keep a car three years, trade it in every three years. So, <laughs> I don't know anything, I don't know what that means by warranty. I don't know. I'm not familiar with that term. 
Now, warranties are getting longer. You know, yeah. we talked about that at lunch. Uh, people are keeping their cars longer because yeah. cars last dramatically longer yeah. now than they used to. Yeah. Uh, but the good news from us who do want customers to be on a, on a shorter cycle is that cars are getting better in terms of fuel efficiency. Yes. So a car from five, six, seven, eight years ago versus today, the fuel efficiency is a huge business case for switching cars. And the other part is technology. Technology is totally different today in a car that you could buy today versus five years ago. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm a guy, I'm looking to buy a car. Mr. Brown, I want to ask you this question. Uh, I'm, I'm looking to buy a car, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working every day, average job. Should I lease or should I buy? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about it? <laughs> depends on mileage. Go, go, go. You know, a lot of it depends on mileage, whether you buy or lease. Uh, if you drive a small number of miles per year, you should lease. If you're driving 20, 30, 40,000 miles a year, you're not a lease candidate. Uh, it costs too much. But when you lease a car, you pay much less for it because leasing is very simple. It's a mathematical equation. You take the value of the car, minus what it's going to be worth in three years, that's a number, add an interest factor to it, divide by 36, and that's your payment. So you're getting your, your trade-in value up front, which reduces your cash flow. So it's an interesting way to go, unless you drive too many miles. Jim? In, in leasing a car, you can drive a much nicer car than you, uh, if you were to buy one on a lease. Uh, for instance, for years, Cadillacs have been leasing very well. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because Cadillac Motor Division has been subsidizing those leases for years, heavily subsidizing them. So you can drive a Cadillac, bring it back in three years, and you say, hey, I don't want it. Take it away. Well, Cadillac has been losing ten to $15,000 on every car. Why is it? Because of, because of? It's really a form of borrowing money, borrowing capital. That's, what it, that's really what it is mm -hmm. for General Motors. They can borrow money that way but they're losing the money three years down the road. So what they do, they keep leasing cars and keep rolling the thing along. So you can drive a nice car cheaper. If you do want to buy it, it's all simple interest. It doesn't cost you any more, but you have that option three years from now. Do I want to buy it or dump it? Bernie? Yeah, it's, it's a psychological thing. It, it, it depends on, you know, some people feel I have to own the car, um, in, in which case, if you're going to keep a car longer than three or four years, you de definitely should buy it. If you're going to keep a car seven, eight years and you know that up front, uh, you're, you're unpatriotic. But you should definitely buy it. You should definitely buy it. <laughs> this question is to all of you. Uh, uh, just, just your opinion, just some comments about the certified pre-owned sales. And, and I mean, that's, and I guess that's driving the sale of, of, of used cars as well. It certainly is. Uh, certified used cars means that the car's been put through a manufacturer's recommended number of points, bullet points, to check out. It also means that in most cases it has the same warranty as a brand new car. Now, where can you buy a used car in history and get the same warranty as you can on a new car? Certified used cars are the way to go, ladies and gentlemen. You're getting a great product with an extraordinary warranty backed by the manufacturer. Bernie? Yeah, no, it, Tom's exactly right, absolutely. Uh, the, the, and on top of that, to support their residual values, they put a lot of money, the manufacturers do, into, into special finance rates for those certified cars. In the case of Mercedes, we just finished a uh, certified pre-owned event where they were waiving your first two payments. Yes. So they want the value of that used car to be as high as possible. So there's a lot of support for the certified programs so they can support high residual values to keep the low lease payments. Are those certified programs mainly for high-end cars? No, not at all. There's certified programs for, for every brand of vehicle. Mm -hmm. and, and the high end makes the most sense because of the uh, uh, resale value issue. But no, you see it in every brand. What about the sale of those luxury cars today? You know, the Mercedes Benzes, the BMWs, the Cadillacs, uh, the Lexuses. Uh, how are they doing compared to previous times? They're doing great. I mean, it, it, you know, there is, uh, you want, what's happening right now is you had traditional luxury cars and you had traditional non luxury cars, but they're starting to really overlap. Uh, Jim mentioned it. You can get a Hyundai or a Kia that looks and feels like what we would have thought a luxury car was 10 years ago. And at the same time, you have BMWs and Mercedes that you can buy under $30,000. So the, the lines are definitely blurring between what it really means to be a luxury car, because everybody wants to be a full, broad spectrum manufacturer now. 
Tom, anything you'd like to add on that? Well, I think they've covered that issue pretty well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is the main thing that a customer looks for when they walk into a dealership? Well, there's a number of things. First of all, they're looking for value. And they're also looking for sincerity. And we try to instill that in all of our salespeople. You know, the days of, of Slick Johnny and Quick Willie and all those things are long since over with. Um, consumers uh, want to be dealt with in a very professional manner. Uh, they'd like to find out how much it's going to cost them with the minimum amount of, uh, of nonsense. And we as an industry, all of us, I believe, have stepped up and tried to eliminate the parts of the buying process that the consumers dislike. Our, our job and our responsibility is to make you look forward to buying a car, uh, not, not, not regret it. We want you to come, enjoy it, and drive a new car, and be very pleased with it, and provide you with the backdrop of service and parts business that will continue to make you satisfied customers. Jim, how do, how do you train your salespeople? Well, getting back to Tom's statement, our typical buyer, I mean, the buyer, the buyer today, which would include everybody in this room, is a pretty sophisticated buyer. Uh, you don't walk blindly into a car dealership looking for a, a kind salesman with a smile. You don't, you don't look for that anymore. You walk in because you've done your research online, you know just about what you want. You pretty much nail it down to the kind of car you want. And in many cases, we have people come in, not only tell you that they want a Lexus, they tell you which model, they tell you the interior, all the equipment, I want this car, get it for me. Uh, Ma'am, we don't have it, um, but let's see what we can do. We run inside real quick. Is this car anywhere available? And if we can supply it, we say, we have this and this happened to me two weeks ago. I said, ma'am, you're not going to believe this, but this car should drop here on a truck Monday morning. She told us exactly what she wanted, color, engine, the option, and that car came in off the carrier Monday and she came up and bought it. But the buyer typically is a very smart buyer today. Is there any room for negotiation when it comes to a new car? Sure. People that tell you, I get a kick out of these dealers. Gosh, I hope we don't have one here. They talk about one price. I'm a one price dealer. You know, in fact, there was a headline today in Penske in the automotive news that Penske's going to go to one price. So I tell customers, well, that's not one price. That's a take it or leave it price. Take it or leave it. I would suggest you leave it and come see us. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth. I love to compete with one price dealers. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Absolutely. Brother, you just want to get back to, to the training of your salespeople. Uh, first of all, what do you look for when you look for someone to work in one of your dealers, uh, dealerships, and, and, and how do you train those individuals? Sure. Well, it all starts with hiring. Uh, I think uh, Tom, Tom and Jim would agree that you, you have to hire the right people. That's A, number one, the most important thing. Uh, then what we do uh, and what we look for in our case is uh, great personality, somebody who's smart, somebody who can take rejection well. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, you know, when you're in any kind of sales environment, you're going to be told no probably more often than you're told yes. So somebody's got to be able to have a great personality that can bounce back from that. Mm -hmm. In terms of training, uh, the manufacturers offer great training on the product. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, spend an enormous amount of time on process training. So we'll spend the first 30 to 60 days with our sales team getting them trained in terms of how our process works. And the key to the whole thing is not to let them uh, leave, provide them opportunities to stay with you. Because we do have a huge investment in your people, and turnover is the absolute opposite of what you need to get done there. What about in the, in, in, in the uh, service department, where you have these technicians? Uh, how important is it to have strong technicians in the service department? Well, I'll take that question. It's vitally important. As I mentioned early on with the question, you buy a car in one day, you bring it back to the dealership on average eight times before you're ready to dispose of it. And any one of those times that you're dissatisfied, not likely to go back to the dealership. We have all of our technicians trained by the manufacturer. Each technician on uh, two times a year, twice a year, will go off to training in Chicago or Cincinnati, wherever it may be at the time. And that costs us money, both we have to continue to pay them salary, benefits, and we have to pay the expense of the training also, the hotel and lodging and so forth. But the only way you get good technicians is to train them and train them and train them. And you know what? The guys welcome that. They want to be able to please you. They look forward to doing that. And with, with today's technology, you look under the hood of a car, it's rather amazing. It, it's a computer. So we continue to train them. And, and also, I mean, we have a, a center 
It's called Ganley Corporate Center. In the beginning, we thought we were going to call it Ganley University, but there was some pushback on that. So all of our employees, uh, all new employees go to the Ganley Corporate Training for as long as a month. New employees go there for three or four days once a year for a refresher course. So that at every one of the Ganley dealerships, we like to think that you're getting the same accommodation and the same type of procedures from each one of my stores. Would you like to add anything? No. You good? Okay. Good. Let's talk. Okay. Let's let's talk about uh, the advertising. Uh, something near and dear to our hearts at uh, Fox A. Uh, <laughs> general Manager back there, Mr. Perizzi. You sure to agree with me? Uh, a lot of ads on television right now, and uh, a lot of ads in the newspapers. Uh, but we we'll talk about the internet. Uh, what role does the internet play in sales for you guys? Well, it's an enormous uh, role that the internet plays. Uh, when it first came out, it, it didn't look like it was going to be that substantial. But I would, I would say to you that minimum of 60% of the folks that are interested in buying a new car research it on the internet. And they come into a dealership ready, they know exactly what they want, they're prepared for it, in some cases better prepared than we are. And it's a great asset, it's a great place to spend your advertising dollars because the return on investment there is extraordinary. Of course, television is the best bang for the buck. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Marino, did you want no, to? No, yeah. I, the internet is uh, the internet's going to be big. Uh -huh. It's, it's going to be big. Uh, <laughs> no, the uh, definitely not as big as TV, but <laughs> no. Obviously, you, you have to be everywhere. You yes. really. It, we, we, one of the things we talked about at lunch is the idea that. Uh, you see a lot of consolidation like in our three companies is really because of those forces because mm -hmm. if you had just one dealership you really have a very difficult time competing in terms of your your scope of your marketing mm -hmm. so you have to be everywhere where a client's going to be and that's increasingly more difficult because it's becoming more and more fragmented but certainly i do agree with you that tv is probably the most efficient media right now because you, people still watch sports big and people still watch the news that's still two big areas the rest of it is getting very, very fragmented. And uh, the good news is that what the internet does allow you to do is let you measure e extremely accurately your return on investment. Excellent. Um, Mr. Brown, is there anything, is, is there such thing as foreign competition these days when, we, when, it, comes to, when it comes to cars? Foreign competition? Foreign competition. At one time, it was all about foreign competition. Uh, does that exist anymore when you consider how where cars are being made? Well, no. As far as, uh, I'm not going to buy a Toyota because it's not made in this country. No, you don't hear that anymore. Well, first of all, because they are made in this country. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, Toyota Camry is still the number one car sold in America. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think, uh, I mean, you can go to union shops in Detroit and find foreign cars in the parking lot. Of course, mm -hmm. they're keyed and glasses are broke on them. But, I mean, <laughs> but there's, uh, no, there's not that distinction. As it, was, as it was at one time. Yes. At one time, you couldn't drive an imported car into Detroit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was dangerous. Mr. Gantley? Well, an interesting thing. I don't know how, how much you're aware of it. Uh, there, there's two points, to, two answers to your question. One, here in northern Ohio, we're blessed with being the second largest home to the auto industry, second only to Detroit. Take a look around you, and you'll see Ford plants, Chrysler plants, General Motors plants. Uh, so so we, we get a great deal of residual value from that. But secondly, there's no longer a foreign car. Virtually every one of them is made here, or in Mex they're North American made, either in the United States, Canada, or Mexico. There's very few cars that are actually imported from overseas. Uh, it, it's a, a real renaissance in the auto industry to think that these manufacturers have come to this country, and, and we support that 100%. Create jobs here. This is where we need the jobs, because if people have jobs, they can buy cars. In the news lately, we've heard a lot about the, uh, the massive recall by General Motors with the ignition switch. Um, is that, first of all, hurting sales? And, and secondly, is it hurting your dealerships? I'll begin with you. We only have uh, one uh, General Motors dealership, the one here in Beechwood, and we haven't seen any effect at all. Uh, it's almost a non-issue uh, among clients. Uh, even though, uh, obviously, there's a lot of press about it. There was just an announcement before we came up on stage talking about how General Motors admits that uh, the engineers uh, designed this part incorrectly and uh, uh, knowingly uh, put it in there. But at the end of the day, that was a long time ago, and that's the old GM. 
I think today cars are very, very good, and clients don't look at that as a judgment point for whether they're going to buy a car or not. Mm -hmm. Mr. Brown, anything you'd like to add to that? <clears throat> it's had no effect. No effect at all? No, it really hasn't. Well, I have a number of General Motors stores, and it has not had a negative effect. If anything, it's had a positive effect. It brings a large number of folks into our service departments with older cars on the recall, gives them an opportunity to stroll through the showroom and suddenly decide that, hey, that's probably not a bad idea to buy a new car. Mm -hmm. This question is for each of you, and I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Ganley. What uh, new models are you most excited about? Well, boy, that's interesting. Uh, probably the one that I'm most excited about, and perhaps none of you are aware of this, uh, BMW is coming out with a 8 Series BMW that will be fully electric, and it's a gorgeous car. It, it's a, it's a two-door coupe, and it'll just knock your socks off. It is really, really gorgeous. So that's the one I'm most excited about. Mm -hmm. Mr. Brown? Well, I thought it was gas and electric, but I'm going to defer to Mr. Ganley here. So, <laughs> yeah, they are bringing that car out. It is an incredible car, and uh, there's also a new uh, three series BMW coming out. That's the all, three series BMW, all electric, and these are these are pretty. But they're exotic. We're going to get one this year. You know, that's nothing to get excited about. We had to buy a display for it, which cost thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> so, you know, you look at it and you say, well, yeah, it's nice. It's nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I was excited about it. Excited about it. <laughs> right, but the cars, the, the cars that really. Uh, got to give Audi the advantage over the last 20 years. They had all-wheel drive cars. And domestic manufacturing, a lot of foreign cars, they just don't get it. You got to get all-wheel drive cars out in Ohio. And they're talking about Toyota Camry, which is the number one seller in the U.S. with an all-wheel drive new Camry. That's going to be an incredible seller. Mm -hmm. And the other guys are coming out with all, and diesels. Mm -hmm. Jesus, you know, Volkswagen's got diesels right now. Um, they got a, they got a diesel that got 50 miles a gallon. Yeah. It says 40 on the window, but you drive it for two weeks, it's getting 50 miles a gallon. The Passat, and um, they're, they're just incredible. Mm -hmm. So those are all really exciting cars. You don't know it's a diesel. You know, there's no fumes or noise. You think it's a regular gasoline engine. But there's a lot of diesels coming, and BMW and, and Volkswagen. There's a lot of really nice stuff coming. Mm -hmm. But I said that three years ago, so I know. <laughs> but it is true. Yeah. Bernie? Well, I'm a car geek. Uh, so for me, uh, the Mercedes uh, AMG GTS. Uh, it's a great car coming out in April. It's got uh, 550 horsepower, two-seater. Uh, I have no idea what gas mileage. It doesn't matter because it sounds so great when you're driving it. Uh, but uh, the uh, AMG GTS. I'll call you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you just can't get one up on him. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, you, you mentioned, uh, Jim, you mentioned diesel. Uh, is, is that the future? Of, of, of cars in this country as far as fuel, or, or, or is it e electricity? No, I don't know that it's the future, but it's going, to be a, it's going to be a good seller as they bring prices down, as they produce more of them, it'll be a good seller, as electric will, gas, electric, hybrids. <clears throat> they all play a part, you know, but I mean, gasoline is still the power plant that uh, powers cars, as far as I can see. <clears throat> what, what's the future of electric cars? You know, I think it's a great future. And I look forward to electric cars becoming the predominant car so that we can kind of stick our nose up to the Arabs where they charge us too much for oil. Uh, it's clearly the future of the auto industry. Uh, it, it's the far out future. Short term, Jim is right, diesels are going to be very popular and they're going to become more and more so. But ultimately, all of us are going to be driving electric cars. Right. Uh, I see it a little, uh, a little bit differently. I think uh, electric te is probably a transitional technology. You know, there's still a lot of issues with batteries in terms of uh, how you, how you, where you source them, where you make them, uh, where, how you dispose of them. I think if you look, depends what future is. If you look at 2025, 2030, I think we're going to see hydrogen fuel cells is probably the predominant technology. I think we just need to bridge the gap between here and there. You know, the internal combustion engine has been a pretty resilient technology. It was invented in 1886, and here we are still talking about it. And what you're seeing is that you can do a lot with internal combustion engines, where today it's not uncommon to see an internal combustion engine that gets 40 plus miles per gallon. And so I think we'll see electric playing a role with the internal combustion engine, but ultimately I think the whole thing gets replaced with hydrogen fuel cells, where the only waste product is, is water. How do you think gas prices right now hovering around $4 a gallon uh, they've been over three for years. 
Has this affected what you do in any way, especially when you talk about high-end car sales? Yeah, what happens is, you know, from a public policy perspective, the issue is that clients don't want to pay for fuel-efficient technology if they don't have to. So if, if you want to get more clients to buy Priuses and electric cars and Nissan Versus and things like that, you have to raise the price of fuel incrementally over time. Because what happens today is instead they're putting incentives on cars that people don't want. So they're saying, hey, you can buy a Tesla and get a $7,500 rebate, or you can buy a Prius and get a $7,500 rebate, but that's not really effectively driving the demand. You really have to adjust gasoline prices up. It's not something I like to say, uh, the idea that I would advocate for more taxes, but it really is the only way to get us off of gasoline. I totally agree with Tom that the number one security issue in America is our ability to be energy independent, and I think we're getting there, but we have to uh, give consumers the right incentives to, to see why they should buy a more fuel-efficient vehicle. Gas prices hurting the sale of luxury cars at all? No, we, no, not at all, zero. No, no it doesn't tend to hurt luxury cars, uh, but when, first of all, it takes a little bit of time for the high prices to filter through. We've just, just now touched $4 a gallon. We'll see, if it stays there for any length of time, we'll definitely see repercussions from it. But in the past, if you take a look, when we've reached that $4 level, shortly thereafter, it starts to drop down also. And uh, th that's the equation that we have to all watch for. If it stays at $4 a car, you have to consider more economical cars. If it drops back down, we'll continue to sell cars in the fashion that we have. How closely do you guys work with the, the manufacturers when it comes to renovations in your dealerships? <laughs> I'll, I'll take that question. I've just finished building about 14 new stores. Uh, the manufacturers dictate to us, even the, the glass at my Volkswagen stores had to be imported from Germany. The tile had to be imported from Germany. Uh, I, but they contribute nothing, zero, to the value of the new buildings. So all of us at times have taken issue with the manufacturers. We were discussing it at lunch. Uh, you know, they overstep their bounds, but they also have the ultimate trigger. If, if you don't do it their way, they suddenly don't send you as many cars. Bernie, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, you can see what they're, they're, what they're trying to do is create a consistent retail environment throughout their network. Uh, and I think probably most manufacturers are reasonable in terms of what they want to do. But when you have, uh, you know, crazy brands like uh, Aston Martin saying that you have to buy your tile from one quarry in Italy and they ship you the toilet from England, that may be a little uh, overboard. But I think what you're seeing today, which is, I think, is great news for our industry, I think if you walk into pretty much most car dealerships today, they're very new, inviting, fresh facilities that I think in enhance the buying and servicing process. So I think the, the old kind of crappy rundown buildings, that's pretty much gone and that's probably a good thing for, for our entire industry. Jim, you've been around for a while. Could you compare the, 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 the boom time we're going through now with previous times in the auto industry? Well, <clears throat> I'm truthfully, I've been in the car business now <clears throat> since, well, I don't know. 50 years, 47 years. It's always been good. There's never really been uh, uh, over one or two bad years in those 50, <clears throat> excuse me, 50 years. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> no, not really bad times, no. No bad times. Huh? Except when the interest rates were 21% or whatever they were back mm -hmm. in 79 and 80, mm -hmm. as he alluded to. With, with that in mind, and, and considering the fact these are good times, um, talk about giving back to the community. How important is that, and what are you doing in that regard, Jim? Well, we do, <clears throat> we do quite a bit. We have pretty big commitments to two or three uh, clean and clinic. <clears throat> I've been interested in, uh, in weight loss for many years, and healthy eating and healthy exercise, that type of thing. And I've uh, made uh, pretty big investments with the clinic, with Lifestyle 180. Uh, <clears throat> for instance, our health care costs uh, five or six years ago was uh, probably around 12 or 13 percent of payroll which is a pretty high uh, health, and health cost. Mm -hmm. And after years of bringing my people in, and I, uh, I have um, doctors come to the dealership, and I haven't talked to 20 people or 30 people, and our health care costs now are down to about 6.9% of payroll. Mm -hmm. It's almost a, you know, cutting it about halfway, but it's because of the lifestyle of our employees. Mm -hmm. We don't hire smokers, and, uh, and we pick the low-hanging fruit. People need help. Look, you've got to go probably against the law, but we tell them, hey, you got to go to this doctor, you know. 
Well, why do I have to do that? Well, to save your life, your wife's life, and your kid's life. And we've been very successful at that. Bernie? Yeah, the community is, is one of our four pillars of our company. <coughs> uh, that's an incredibly important part of what we do. I believe my personal uh, belief, it comes from the way I was raised and my mom and my dad, that business people have a moral responsibility to give back more from the community than they took. And so we have somebody dedicated uh, to that effort, to the, our community relations effort. Uh, my personal passion is education, and uh, because there is no greater way to provide people opportunity than giving them access to a great education. So we spend a lot of time, effort, energy in that. Uh, we give all of our team members one day off a year paid so that they can go out and uh, be a part of the community. All of our managers are required to serve on some form of nonprofit board on their own, whatever their passion may be. So the, our aspect where community comes first is absolutely critical in our company. Father, you Tom. Well, I'm proud to tell you that I was the head of Crime Stoppers of Northern Ohio for the past 12 years until I became quite ill. Uh, during those 12 years, we took more felons off the street than any other endeavor relative to that. And the Ganley Auto Group uh, provided for all of the rewards. And I'm probably the most proud of the reward that we gave for uh, an inner city arson that killed nine children. It took us three years, but we paid a $25,000 reward for the information that led to the conviction and, and incarceration of some pretty nasty people. Who could kill nine innocent children? Uh, it, it, I find that bizarre. But we also, uh, I, I'm also the, uh, the lead supporter of the Cleveland Police Historical Foundation and the Cleveland Police Foundation. Uh, we back numerous little league baseball, basketball, football, soccer teams throughout Northern Ohio and are proud to do that. Uh, but, but the biggest function has been Crime Stoppers, and uh, that's something I'm enormously proud of. Okay. Round of applause for our panel. This concludes the first part. <laughs> this concludes the first part of uh, of our uh, afternoon, and the next part will involve you. We'll take uh, questions uh, from the audience. But this is our halftime. All right, as is our tradition here at the uh, corporate club luncheon. We want to open uh, the discussion up to you. If you have questions for any one of our panelists, it is now time for you to ask those questions and they will answer them as uh, you know, straightforward as they can. Yes. Do we have someone over there? Okay, do you have a mic back there? Okay. Hi gentlemen, my name is Laura culber -Mintz, and I have a two-parted question. First of all, I'm curious as to what each of you drive. I guess I'll start it. I'm driving a 750 IL BMW. Jim, you're next. Uh, <clears throat> same car. <laughs> <laughs> and I got here first in my S550 Mercedes. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my question. Do you, you guys need a driver? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right, next question. See so, yeah, um, second part. The second part, oh, second, of, part. I'm sorry. second part of my question. Bernie, I am an awesome salesperson. I want to work for you. You have any jobs? Absolutely. Absolutely. See me after Here's the, the gathering, right at the door. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Okay. Hi, I'm Greg Gershon, Gershon, Sokol, and John of CNC. And my question for you is since you all three have literally drive yourself to Who do you want to answer that? Uh, whoever feels most well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. I was just out in Mountain View uh, about a month ago with, with Mercedes-Benz. And I think Google's uh, doing a lot of that technology more for Google's sake, uh, because what they're trying to do is figure out your patterns of behavior as a buyer. So they know that your commute to work is a certain road. And then they take a look at, compare your, your online behavior with your offline behavior, and they're trying to really aggregate it. So th the mission is different for Google. I think what you will find is that uh, Mercedes, BMW, Nissan 
are really moving towards an autonomous car. And it's not a matter of whether that's going to happen, it's when it will happen and who's going to get there first. Uh, so I would venture to guess that uh, in 2020, my personal opinion is that you'll be able to get in your car, leave this luncheon today, hit a button, it's your address of your office, and you can get on your iPad, on your phone, and off you go and your car drives itself. And I think the reality is that will be probably one of the greatest things that could possibly happen. Because most 99.9% .9 of accidents are caused because of human error. And if you can take that out of the picture, I think it's a pretty great thing. So I think Google's technology, they're, do just doing a, they're getting a lot of press for it. But if you really take a look, it's really happening in the manufacturer level where that's going to happen. That would be the death of those high performance cars, though, it would seem. No, see, I look at it the other way, because then you, people look for experience to have that. So you'll want to have a car that you drive and experience yourself. And then there's a car that's transactional. There are times, you know, I, we can drive, I can drive a Porsche turbo convertible and you think, well, that would be more fun, but it's not when you're working. But on Saturdays and Sundays, that's a great car. So your office is becoming, your, your car is becoming your, your office. office. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Hi, my name is Joe Gordon. I'm, I'm a consultant at Central Cadillac. Uh, I've been around the business for a number of years. One of my concerns is that you never, ever hear any of the young people talk about wanting to go to work in a car dealership and they get out of school. They have absolutely no interest. What will that say? What can you dealers do to change that mentality to develop an interest in being in car sales? I've been around car sales a long time. My good friend, uh, Mr. Dawson, up there, and I can go back and leave. But that is not a design. They don't even talk about that. You want to be a fireman, engineer, policeman. You know how difficult it is to get good people and to keep them. What can happen, or what can you folks do to change that environment? I'll grab that. Uh, I'd like to answer that. Uh, we have a major focus on returning servicemen. Those men and women that devoted their lives to our country to keep all of us free, and we know that uh, there's no such thing as freedom without a price. And these ladies and gentlemen have paid the price, so we're actively soliciting and providing jobs to all returning service people. I'm not sure I heard the question. But the, 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 the question is, how, how do you get young people to, you guys do to, to get cars? into the, you guys do a lot of that. To the to the car business? Sir? How do you get young people to get into the car business? Well, we hire, we, we probably got 70 or 80 young kids working for us. And we bring them in, even high school kids, uh, to be porters. And uh, the interest is incredible. And if they're working there three months, six months, we, uh, we talk to them. Are you, would you have an interest in the car business when you get out of high school? Or, and, uh, you know, you can get into being a porter, you can learn how to work in the service department, and maybe your ultimate goal should be, or your near-term goal should be a service writer, which is pretty easy to teach. And so we develop a lot of kids. We've had a lot of kids that started with us when they were 16 years old. But can I answer something about the car? Yeah. There's nobody driving it. If I'm going down the road from the dealership to my house, on many occasions with my wife, Right in front of me, a squirrel will jump out in the road, or a little chipmunk. Now, she screams at me so loud. Can that car stop in time for that chipmunk? Chipmunk's going to die. Huh? The chipmunk's going to die. <laughs> that's, that's the driver. Like I say, shopping classic, drives. folks. This man has no <laughs> compassion. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Well, I'm serious. No, well, I, don't I mean, know. anything can happen instantly in yeah. front of you. Is that car going to be able to stop? That's, that's, what that's all the, the stuff that they yeah, have to I figure out. I don't think they're ever going to happen. Yeah. We have another question in the back. I don't know. Oh. I'm in. General, my name is Chuck Price. I'm a former car dealer. Uh, recently, the uh, state of Ohio allowed Tesla uh, to be able to sell cars uh, as a manufacturer, not as a franchise dealer. How are your feelings about this? It could potentially ruin the franchise system uh, in, the, in the state or in the country. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into that one because I probably have a contrarian view. I certainly have a contrarian view to uh, what uh, the dealer association currently believes. Uh, I think if Tesla wants to sell cars directly to the public, they absolutely have a, a, a constitutional right to be able to do that. I think we live in a free society in which free businesses should be able to do exactly what they want to do. And I think the idea that car dealers get together and create an organization that tries to prevent something from uh, impeding their business is just wrong. Uh, we, I look at it from the perspective of if we don't add value as a dealer to the chain, then we should be eliminated. However, I feel that we do add a tremendous amount of value. And the reality is that a car dealership is an entrepreneurial business, as you know. And we are the ones that can make that happen locally and be part of the community and create tremendous value for the client and for the manufacturer. A manufacturer isn't going to do the things that we do. They're not, A, they're not going to lose money selling new cars. That's not going to happen. They would not be in the used car business and they would have a whole detached viewpoint of their consumers. So from my perspective, I welcome that competition. I wish that we lived, I wish I lived in a town where every dealership was owned by the manufacturer and I was the sole entrepreneur because we would do really well in that scenario. Right, give me five. <laughs> That's true though. <laughs> the inventor Hi, of the car business in Cleveland, Ohio. I would like to know very simply, if you three gentlemen have not been able to become automobile dealers, what other profession might you have chosen? Well, I guess I'll start with that. Uh, my parents would have loved to see me become an attorney. Uh, but I didn't. I became an automobile dealer. I just killed myself. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Lee, despite your advice to the contrary, you did not want me to go work for General Motors. So that, but that is, if I weren't in the car business being a dealer, I would have worked for, for I would still be uh, pursuing a manufacturing uh, job. Could I ask you a question, Lee? <laughs> <laughs> Are you still taking piano lessons? Yes. <laughs> Are you any good? <laughs> any more questions out there? There's one over here. All right. Well, in my case, that's what I have a son for, <laughs> uh, because I don't have a clue. But he's hired people, and he has a staff of three, four people to five people. And that's what they work on about every day. That's what they work on. Yeah, I've, in my case, I've been accused of uh, jumping at every shiny object that comes my way uh, from a technology perspective. But the reality, I, I look at it as when it becomes somewhat mainstream. Like, if you think about Facebook, eight or nine years ago, it was a fringe technology, and today it is completely mainstream. So you have to be engaged in that world. Uh, what's happening is, is now Snapchat, Instagram, Vine, all of those are, you have to kind of watch and see. Uh, and uh, Wayne, you'll be very happy to know that we, the reality is major media, mass media still plays a gigantic role. So you have to kind of watch those technologies. And from my perspective today, it's more about re reputation management in those in that area than so much in the marketing side. Good afternoon again, gentlemen. As we know, online reviews have really changed the way of our business works because customers come into your shop not only expecting you to meet their own expectations, but the expectations of all those experiences that they read about online. So kind of you know piggybacking on what you just said, how do you manage online reviews and your online reputation with consumers? Good question. Well, we respond to each and every one, whether they're positive or negative, 
and, and we think that's the way to, uh, to generate more positive uh, uh, reviews. Oh, well, we, we, uh, we respond within seconds of uh, inquiry on the internet, and we guarantee a price quote in uh, eight minutes. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. Yeah, if you, if you build a strategy around saying you want to deliver a great, wonderful, wow experience, that's what's going to create a culture in which you get your clients to want to jump online and give you a review. At the same time, how do you avoid, how do you, you, don't, you really don't have an option of managing your negative reviews. Clients are going to say what they're going to say. So your strategy has really got to be around how do you make absolutely certain that you never have any cracks in your process, that you never give anybody the reason to go online and give you a negative review. So the internet has been a wonderful, wonderful thing for each one of your businesses. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any other questions out there? We have one. Oh. Mr. Dunn. That's Wayne, thank you. Gentlemen, thank you very much. This has been a wonderful program and it's a wonderful representation of what North Eastern Ohio is all about. I, uh, I told a few stories in my life and I think there's a couple that are due now. To answer some of the questions, Lee Seidman was washing dishes in college, deciding whether he wanted to go in the restaurant business. He made the right decision. I was washing dishes too, and I still am. <laughs> well, I do want to say one more thing. Secondly, uh, there was an interesting comment here from uh, the second largest automotive market in the, in the country. And uh, one day I asked Roger Penske, um, how come Cleveland, the second largest automotive area in the country, Manufacturing. Has, uh, has lost the Grand Prix? Well, his answer to me at that time was, how come the largest automotive area in the country has lost the Grand Prix? And that was Detroit, of course. Roger has reopened Detroit. What is it going to take for us to reopen Cleveland? I mean, it's, it's time. It's enough time. Then, one more Roger Penske story and uh, and when I was young and washing dishes, I took my car to be repaired at uh, a little garage up on Kinsman and Lee back in behind the shopping center. And one day at a function about five, six, seven years ago, some older gentleman came in and he said, hey, I used to fix your car. I said, where were you? He said, I was over at uh, Kinsman and Lee, and I used to fix your mother's car and sometimes your car. I said, oh, okay, I remember you. He said, but I have a story to tell you. I said, what's that? He said, I used to fix Ron Trapensky's mother's car, too. I said, hey, that's great. He said, and I, he said and then a strange thing happened. I said, what's that? He said, well, Roger would bring his mother's car to the garage, he put it up on a lift, he took it, and he fixed it himself. Then he started taking apart cars in my garage and fixing them. I said, so what would you do? He said, I threw them out. <laughs> and he said he's been sorry ever since. <laughs> anyways, anyways, thanks for being here. I love you guys, and I hope you come back again, and I hope that, you know, I, I'm still around, and we're still around. But if I might call your attention to um, our newest edition. Well, uh, uh, fancy. We have, uh, we have added a, a room to our building. It's our, our tent room. It is a um, fully standard tent that can survive most of the weather that Cleveland has to offer. It will be used about eight, nine months out of the year. And uh, anybody that would like to see it is welcome to it. And if anybody wants to have a part in it, they may, and this place comes with them. And anyways, thanks enough for that. All right. Yeah, just one thing.
Go ahead. You're wired. Go ahead. Before we go, uh, Mr. Brown wants, wants a final word. It was just I was here three years ago, and I made a mistake when somebody at the table all the way back here said, if you had to give me one word as a key to your business, what would it be? And so I quickly I said, well, service. And everybody up here agreed. <clears throat> and I thought about it over the last three years. And uh, the key to the car business is the key to every business, and that is answer your phone. Because you can't get phones answered no matter who you call, and you can't get anybody. So answer your phone, number one. Number two, at this table, some guy said, and I'm gone. He says, Mr. Brown, <clears throat> I'm in the, in the stock market. I want to buy some stock. Give me a stock tip, as if I would know anything. I said, yeah, I've got a stock tip for you. Buy Ford. Ford is the way to go. It was two bucks a share. Well, it's been three years. He's never called me back and thanked me. <laughs> <laughs> and it went to, what, 18? <laughs> final word. So my, my final word is that, uh, uh, like these two, uh, my, my, I have a, uh, a children as well, and uh, my son's with me here today on his 16th birthday. So. <laughs> And now, other than making him come here for his 16th birthday, the fact that I embarrassed him does not make me doubt of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ganley, final word. <laughs> My final word is, first of all, thank you for being here. Uh, I, I, I'd like to introduce a table in the back with all of my advisors, the professional advisors that I've used, Friedman and Levitt, Steve Dever, Terry McHugh, uh, I can't say, uh, my chief financial officer, Joe Forno. Uh, those, these are the kind of people, and up front, are, are the most key people, uh, my internal audit staff, and the um, uh, service and parts division. Uh, I thank them all for being here, but I thank you for being here. I thank you for being part of the auto industry, to listen to what we had to say, to ask us questions. That's the interaction that we look forward to. We thank you very, very much, and we look forward to doing it again, if you'd like us to. All right. Tom Ganley, Ganley Auto Group. Jim Brown, Classic Auto Group. Bernie Marino, Collection Auto. Another round of applause for our great panelists this go. afternoon. Excellent, excellent Thank job, you. gentlemen. Thank you very much. My name is Dwayne Dawson, Fox 8 News. Thank you very much for coming, and have a great afternoon.